we go. Hello, welcome to Image Bearers. My name is Atoma Edgy. I'm so excited to have with us today, uh, Catherine Stewart, uh, who's written an incredible, incredible book that helped me to understand some very important things uh, in reference to the uh, intersection between Christianity and power, um, and in a, in a really in a bad way. I think that there can be a combination, but it's not been used for the good in the respect that we're gonna look at today. So uh, Catherine Stewart is the author of Power Worshippers, which is the subtitle is Inside the Dangerous Rise of Religious Nationalism. It was published uh, almost a year ago in March of 2020. Uh, a little bit of background about Catherine Stewart. She has been re reporting on the intersection of religion, politics, policy, and education for over a decade. She's contributed to such publications as the New York Times, Washington Post, The Atlantic, The Guardian, um, and others. Her previous book, which was um, her first in this kind of field, if you will, was The Good News Club. And I'm sure she'll share about that a little bit too. Um, that was published in 2012. She's also published two novels and co-wrote a book about the musical Rent. Um, so, uh, and she's, I've seen her on other uh, interviews. She does a, an incredible job. I think you guys are in for a real treat today. So again, welcome to the program. Oh, thank you so much. It's really great to see you today. Yeah, good to see you too. Um, so I guess just to start out, can you tell us a little bit more about yourself besides the uh, bio that I have here and also what inspired you to write this uh, awesome book, The Power, uh, Power Worshippers? Great. Yeah, I got interested in the topic of the intersection of religion and politics um, back in 2009. I was living in Santa Barbara, California, and a Good News Club came to our daughter's public elementary school. Good News Clubs are, for anybody who's not familiar with them, they're designed to convert children in their very earliest years of learning into a very deeply fundamentalist form of evangelical Christianity. They target very little kids. Uh, they only go into elementary schools, you know, not middle schools or high schools. So it's really those kids in the earliest years of learning. Um, they use uh, books with no words, just pictures and shapes uh, in order to target children who are too young to read. Um, and they, they confuse little kids into thinking that the public school endorses their form of religion and they encourage children attending the clubs to proselytize and recruit their classmates. So I was really astonished to learn that there are thousands of these clubs operating in public elementary schools around the country. They seemed to me pretty, frankly, inappropriate in a diverse public school setting. But at first I, I sort of thought they were a kind of relic of the American past. And it turns out I was really wrong about that. Um, the more, you know, I don't have a problem with kids talking with their friends about religion in public schools, but I do have a problem with them being deceived into thinking that their public school endorses a particular form of faith and then using that sort of misperception to try and what I could only describe as sort of bully their peers into joining them. Um, many students that I, um, whose families I spoke to um, said their kids were sort of targeted and told that they were going to go to hell because they went to the wrong kind of church. Um, and then the mom, uh, or because they didn't believe in Jesus, I, a, a mom I knew said, her daughter came home and said, mommy, we're going to go to hell because we didn't go to the right kind of church. And, and uh, they're teaching this in school. And, you know, public schools have a kind of cloak of authority in the minds of very little children. They simply can't distinguish between what's taught in their school and one that what's sponsored by their school. So, you know, the more I learned about these clubs and the movement behind them, the more sort of disturbed I became. And I was kind of shocked that they were, um, you know, legal and possible in public schools. And I sort of asked, how is this possible? And I, I sort of learned about the legal movement that was behind placing these clubs in public elementary schools. It's those kind of, legal juggernaut of the religious right. And I was really kind of stunned by that uh, movement's coherence and high level of strategic thinking. So in 2012, I published a book on the topic called The Good News Club. Uh, yeah. And over the years, I just kept digging deeper. And I discovered that good news clubs were 
just one small part of a much larger attack on public education. Mm -hmm. And the attack on public education was really just one part of a larger attack on America as a modern pluralistic uh, constitutional republic. So the power worshipers is the culmination of a, a decade of work in this, in this area. Mm. <clears throat> I can tell, because I, as I was going through it, it's like every single chapter was like a doorway into a whole new uh, understanding of just a whole lot of really craziness. That's, that's all I can say. And it really made me sad as a Christian to understand that these things are done in the name of God uh, that are really oppressing so many people and not really giving them hope and so forth. Um, second question I have for you is uh, in reference to one of the uh, key figures, which is Rolf Drollinger. Um, so he is an example of someone who combined Christianity with partisan politics. So can you please provide uh, some insight into his theology and his impact, especially related to, and which this really surprised me, uh, his theory, that's all I can call it, and really whack theory, of flat tax, deregulation, uh, how government social programs should be ran, international outreach and immigration. That's kind of a lot, but anywhere you want to kind of dive into that, I just was astounded by, and actually it made a lot of sense as I thought about it, but as a Christian, I've always like looked at certain things happening in the news and so forth. And I've wondered how can people who consider themselves Christian espouse views that are so contrary to the word of God? And I think your book really helped me to see that. So if you can maybe just share about, you know, Rolf Drollinger, who he is, and then just some of the aspects that were noted. Yeah, absolutely. You know, uh, I'll sort of preface this by talking a little bit about the movement, you know, it's invested for decades in all of the infrastructure of modern political campaigns. It's invested in uh, right-wing policy groups, legal advocacy groups, networking organizations, legislative initiatives and all that stuff. But there are sort of people, uh, there's a kind of leadership cadre that have uh, established a kind of ideology. And I think to a largely underappreciated degree, they've been allied with a kind of libertarian far-right economic policy. And Ralph Drollinger uh, is, I think, a real, uh, is emblematic of this. So I learned a lot about Ralph Drollinger and the economic ideology of the movement. You know, people often say it's like a culture war, it's about abortion, but you know, the lead, it's about much more than those like, you know, hot button culture war issues. And a lot of it has to do with economics. So I learned a lot about that when I went to Ralph Drollinger's 20th anniversary celebration. It took uh, of his ministry. Why did, you, why did you do that? Well, because I wanted to know what he was <laughs> all about. I found out that he had a weekly Bible study in the nation's capital uh, mm -hmm. that was attended by at least 11 or 12 out of 15, like, you know, members of Trump's cabinet. I mean, right. you thought, you know, the, if you looked at his website, it included people like, you know, uh, Betsy DeVos and Alex Azar and Jeff Sessions and like all these incredibly powerful people. And he also has Bible study groups targeting the Senate and the House of Representatives. Mm -hmm. And he's establishing ministry in state capitals and among political leaders around the world. So here's this guy, he's arguably the most politically influential pastor in America. So I, I wondered why did he hold his uh, 20th, he's got this incredible influence and platform. Why is he having his 20th in, you know, anniversary celebration at an agricultural fair in the San Joaquin Valley? So I had to go. And I realized, number one, not only, you know, he's from California, he started his ministry in California, but number two, a lot of the early funding for his ministry was from the plutocrats of the agriculture world. And indeed, Trump's agricultural secretary, Sonny Perdue, was there um, himself giving a speech to endorse uh, Drollinger and sort of discuss, you know, how lucky they were to have him teaching in the cabinet. So the expansiveness of Drollinger's positions, as you mentioned earlier, on like domestic and economic policy, really hits home the fact that the Christian nationalist movement is a political movement. It's not just about the culture wars. Right. So he, I, he weighs in a number of economic policies, like the idea that social welfare programs have no basis in scripture. Mm -hmm. He teaches these Bible study guides. You can find them online. He's not hiding, it's all in plain sight, right? 
And he says, um, and one of them that the responsibility to meet the needs of the poor lie first with the husband in a family and secondly with um, the, you know, for the husband, second with the family, third with the church. Um, but he wrote, nowhere does God command the institutions of government to fully support those with genuine needs. Um, so I've got another um, uh, Bible study here. He's got here, it's called Solomon's Advice on How to Eliminate 20.5 trillion debt. See these Bible studies, you can get them. Anybody can get them. He's written books. I've got this book of his, Rebuilding America, the Biblical Blueprints, where he's sort of advising all of this stuff. He's, he's telling this stuff to political leaders. I just want to read from this one, this Bible study. He's talking about um, um, God's formula for wealth creation. He says, leaders, government leaders must incentivize individuals and industries which includes unencumbering them from the unnecessary burden of government regulations. And then he talks about incentivizing population growth, citing a, a beef, um, blessed to the man whose quiver is full, a full quiver, a quiver was commonly understood to mean five. The term quiver full is often used to describe um, many of the sort of, um, sort of hyper conservative um, Christians use the term quiver full to describe the very large families they have. They're creating children who are like, will be, you know, arrows in their quiver, arrows for God. It's like, it's very interesting language, but he's sort of using his reading of the Bible because it's not everybody's reading the Bible, of course. He's using his reading the Bible to make very specific policy, um, I would say, um, I wouldn't even say recommendations. I mean, you know, that's sort of a softer word than what he's saying, he's saying this is what God means and this is what it means for economic policy. And, you know, um, these like, I mean, here's another one. I just, if you don't mind, I've just got a third sure, one. Sure. He's, he talked in, in about um, how um, employers should treat their workforce. And he, he had this uh, Bible study called Toward a Bebel, Better Biblical Understanding of lawmaking. And he cited from the New Testament, uh, the first letter of Peter uh, 2.18, he said, servants be submissive to your masters with all respect, not only to those who are gentle and good, but also to those who are unreasonable. And here he was explaining that the principle of submitting to your master, your I'm sorry, your boss, carries over to today. And using this whole idea about servants be submissive to your masters, not just to those who are gentle and good, but also those who are unreasonable. I mean, this is, you know, a, an ideology that's going to disempower the workforce, create a sort of submissive, compliant workforce, and, you know, um, and it's music to the ears of the agribusiness leaders that have supported him in the past and other business leaders that he's trying to um, please in the present. It's an ideology that um, they want, you know, minimal workers' rights and uh, right. environmental deregulation, uh, deregulation of business, that they can use to sort of maintain and increase their profits. Um, and it's, uh, you know, it's, it's a very distinct sort of far right economic ideology. Uh, Barton says that God opposes progressive income taxes, capital gains taxes, and minimal, minimum wage laws. And so it kind of shows that, you know, this is not a stance in the culture wars. This is not just about abortion. This is really about a kind of vision, a broad um, political and economic vision. And it hits home the fact that Christian nationalism is a political movement that's exploiting religion for political purposes. Mm. Yeah, wow, it's very enlightening reading, reading through this or listening through it. So the other, can you talk about, I guess, these maybe three aspects, the flat tax, just cover that briefly, deregulation and immigration because i think he uses the tower of babel for immigration which is like no no yeah I, it's amazing I, I he spoke uh, about each of those three things and i don't have in front of me the language that he used but i remember he talked about the tower of babel and there was some language about how it's in it's in my book <laughs> um uh immigration uh, definitely at some point he had written um like if I think this was during the, um, this is something that he'd written before Trump came to power and he was uh, all anxious about economic policy, you know, the, and Obama. And he said, if, if uh, I'm gonna murder this quote, unfortunately, it's something about if, if you know, the government doesn't 
uh, adopt a flat tax immediately. It's you know grounds for some kind of you know protest, some big protest. But it is in my book. But you see that he advocates for very specific, um, a range of very specific economic policies, all of which end up really. Look, let, let's face facts. We have um, rising, you know, unprecedented levels of economic inequality in our country, and. Um, you know, this is a movement that claims to stand for the American family, but they're advocating policy positions that are making it so much harder for American families to succeed. Yeah, and I think with the flat tax, um, the thing that stood out to me was, you know, the I think the point was made that, uh, you know, 10% is was the Old Testament number. And, you know, if someone is making $16,000 a year, then they pay their 10%, and that's fine. But then someone who's making $300,000, they should also pay 10%. They shouldn't pay any more than that because that's the that's what the Bible says. Mm -hmm. And that's actually not true, but that's the stance that he was using to really help plutocrats to, you know, be able to keep more of their wealth. So, you know, it's almost like he took the Bible and he looked at it through a rich man's eyes and then made all his policies uh, and edicts, if you will, you know, kind of from that. And then on the Tower of Babel, kind of as we're talking about, I think he said something to the effect of, you know, God never intended for different nations to be together, but that they're supposed to be separate. And therefore we're in favor of all this kind of, you know, uh, keeping people apart. It's just crazy, just crazy talk. I know, you know, um, I think when you have massive economic inequality as we do and sort of multiply it with a range of other inequities, two things happen in society. First of all, you have a population with a considerable amount of resentment and anxiety. Frankly, it all ends of the economic spectrum. And second, you have a kind of moneyed elite that rises to power and needs a way to manipulate the disempowered masses. And what Christian nationalism does is it's really kind of a marriage between a subset of plutocracy. Obviously, there are a lot of people with lots of money who also disagree with this agenda, but uh, some subset does. And uh, and then you have a sort of, mm, you know, resentful bottom, you know, of the population that is sometimes very susceptible to um, messaging that seeks to, you know, cast them as a sort of victims of um, cultural persecution. I'm not sure what Bible they're reading, I'll tell you. It's, just, it's crazy. It's crazy. Uh, another individual that you shared about was uh, C. Peter Wagner and, uh, you know, just how he kind of coined this term dominion theology from his reading of the scripture. And he then uh, has, you know, been like, a, in, in a sense, uh, I won't say a role model, but an example, I guess, that a lot of people use today in Christian nationalism. So maybe can you share a little bit about him and his impact on Christian nationalism today with his dominion theology? Yeah, he's a really fascinating figure. He is, um, uh, you know, C. Peter Wagner was a professor uh, of church growth at Fuller Theological Seminary, who was very influential. He authored over 70 books and founded various ministries. And he's wi widely referred to as a godfather of dominionist ideology. So he wrote this book, um, 2008, Dominion, How Kingdom Action Can Change the World. And um, he explains that God commanded true Christians to gain control. These are Christians as he understands Christianity. Of course, we know Christianity is very diverse and many Christians sort of reject the politics of conquest and division that this vision represents. But he explained that God had commanded true Christians, right, to gain control of what he called the seven molders or mountains of culture and influence uh, or areas of civilization that uh, he sort of I, I had identified and, uh, and lit, a few others had, had identified, um, it, which included government, business, education, the law, family, um, uh, and, and these areas. And, and they were supposed to do, you know, dominate those seven molders and mountains of cultures. And he, he wrote that apostles, which is you know, how he viewed uh, these folks, he said, have responsibility for taking dominion over whatever molder or culture of culture or subdivision God has placed them in. And he cast this as taking dominion back from Satan. So, um, you know, 
it's a it's a very interesting vision. It, Wagner is not necessarily a household name outside of um, certain circles, but his work is really broadly influential within it. So Tim Keller, for instance, who is the vice president and co-founder of the Gospel Coalition, which no doubt you're um, familiar with, it's like incredibly influential. He published a book in 2012 called The Church Planter Manual, in which he thanks and credits Wagner in the preface and several other times in the book. And that he, he basically cites, and he's only citing a few people in the preface in the book. It's like a half page preface and he thanks Wagner. So it kind of shows that Wagner is this very influential figure among other influential figures. Um, but, you know, um, once, you know, this movement, this sort of um, dominionist movement was really once more in the shadows of the religious right, you know, wasn't really, um, its representatives weren't necessarily invited to the big, uh, um, gatherings like the Values Voter Summits or the Road to Majority Conferences and the like. But, you know, Seven Mountains Dominionist promoter Lance Wallnow, do you know who he is? No, he, I don't think I have heard of him. Oh, you, you, you're going to have so much fun learning about him. He's, okay. He wrote God's Chaos Candidate about Donald Trump, and he's sort of a big figure within the New Apostolic Reformation. Um, he was given a featured speaking slot at the 2018 Values Voter Summit, which is, the, I would say, the main religious right activist gathering every year. It takes place in Washington, DC in a you know big, wonderful hotel and all the sort of heavy hitters are there. And Lance Walnow was invited to give a presentation. And it so really reflects the fact that these ideas that were once considered more on the fringe have moved closer to the center. So you know you won't necessarily see um, all the sort of leaders of the religious right um, you know holding up Lance Walnow's book and um, and, and the like, but they are often, or, or citing Wagner directly, but they offer Pepper their speeches and discussions with references to the mountains of culture or the seven pillars of culture or the seven molders of culture. So you're just seeing this, these ideas that were once on the fringe were sort of coming close to the mainstream. Mm, scary, scary. Uh, I mean, I can understand like, you know, having different ways that like a church should kind of espouse these things and that makes sense to me but I think to impose that on a culture that's that's I don't know that's going like out there you know and that should not be done because as you said I think you and I you know you and I talked before uh there's different different ways people look at certain scriptures and that's always going to be like a very challenging thing to say well what what in what way are you interpreting this and now you're imposing that view on on me or others you know so yeah, I mean, the, here's the thing. America is inherently pluralistic. It's irreducibly pluralistic, um, you know, and uh, uh, I think the sort of idea of um, embracing the pluralism and allowing for pluralism within our societies is an idea that has really held our society together, even as so many others have been torn apart by sectarian division. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So uh, in chapter three of your book, you explain about the uh, major uh, moral majority, kind of break that down a little bit, you know, how it started, uh, I think Paul Weyrich and others. And I think there's some false history, revisionist history going around saying that mor the moral majority and, you know, the religious right as we know it today kind of started uh, as a, uh, as a um, way to combat you know, what was started back in 1973 with, with uh, you know, the stance on abortion, Roe versus Wade and so forth. And you basically share that that's really not how the moral majority started. So if you can share how it actually started and also um, with that, the next question is if we're to really go ahead to, you know, try to find ways to reduce abortion, it's not just Supreme Court justices, these kinds of things. There are actual ways that this can be done you know, reducing abortion, if you can maybe kind of tackle those two things. Yeah, those are both really important questions. So I'll, I'll take them in order. <laughs> I mean, um, the first is what role did abortion play in bringing together the early movement that preceded the religious right? The, these leaders called themselves the new right. They were really unhappy with the direction of the culture. They felt like it was going too much in a liberal direction. Um, there were people like Paul Weyrich and Howard Phillips and and uh, so many others. Um, and they, they really wanted to ignite a kind of hyper-conservative 
counter-revolution. Um, a lot of them were animated by uh, anti, you know, hostility to communism. Uh, and there was a lot, you know, to be uh, worried about there, but at the same time, you know, they were um, a little fanatical about it. I mean, Phyllis Schlafly, who was sort of part of that early movement, uh, she gave a quote at some point in the 50s where she said, if we're not careful, America's going to be communist by 1973. Well, <laughs> that's not exactly what happened. So, um, you know, the movement has sold us this idea that they uh, they came together around opposition to uh, abortion. But um, I would have to say the, the key issue, one of the key issues that animated the movement in its earlier days, in addition to like fear of communism, but a really big fear was they were really unhappy with the civil rights era and they were really unhappy with racial integration in public schools. And they were really afraid that um, they had created these segregated, segregated academies. Um, they were called, um, people referred to them as segregation academies when uh, the um, uh, decision came down, Supreme Court decision to integrate public schools. A lot of uh, white uh, pastors started their own schools that were uh, religious and, um, and they would only accept white students and they were called you know, segregation academies. And they were really worried that um, their, uh, these schools might be deprived of their lucrative tax exemptions. I mean, Bob Jones uh, Sr. was one of the, um, he was, uh, he had this, uh, I mean, Bob Jones had this school that was racially segregated and the IRS was starting to look at it and say, well, that was I up until 2000, 2002, or I forget what exactly, but it was only recently. Shockingly, I, I shot, yeah. I know it was for a very long time, they had like a, a range of really uh, offensive uh, rules. So, you know, Jerry Falwell and a lot of the other sort of white Southern conservative pastors were very involved in these schools. Um, uh, Bob Jones called segregation God's established order. He, he actually referred to desegregationists as satanic propagandists who are leading colored Christians astray. I mean, it's really disgusting language, right? And, and you know, as far as they were concerned, they had the right to segregate uh, children and also to get federal money for the purpose. So they sort of coalesced around that fear. And they, they were looking for a way to sort of ignite this hyper-conservative counter-revolution and turn back the clock. But they knew that the, like, the rallying cry that they, you know, they couldn't rally around the, 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 the idea that, you know, we want to preserve tax money for segregationists. They knew that that was going to be like really un, uh, uh, unpleasant for a lot of people. So they kind of got together and went down a laundry list of issues and abortion wasn't at the top of their list. But, uh, you know, we're talking like 1979 or so, about six years after Roe versus Wade passed. Um, and, um, you know, they're all upset about you know, women's movement and things. But when they, they came to abortion, it was almost like a light bulb went off. And they were like, huh, that could work. Randall Balmer, the historian from Dartmouth, he's written, a, he was uh, actually in touch with uh, some of these folks and attended some of their meetings. And he's written uh, uh, quite a lot about this. His testimony is really important. So this part of the history has effectively been erased by the conservative leadership of the movement. And most Americans have been persuaded over time that abortion is an issue that should matter the most when it comes to their vote. But let's, you know, when Roe versus Wade passed, we have to remember that most Protestant Republicans supported it. In 1971 and 1974, again, the Southern Baptist Convention published editorials hailing uh, liberalization of abortion law. Um, Ronald Reagan passed the most liberal abortion law in the country in 1967. So, um, but you know, it was only over time that pro-choice voices were purged from the Republican Party. And um, Phyllis Schlafly has actually written an extraordinary book describing how she and some other uh, right to life activists um, made that happen. It, it took a long time and it took a tremendous amount of work um, but so the sort of issue of abortion is a political issue, the, the sort of single issue that is today is really a modern creation and it was created for political purposes. Okay, so I know one of the big things that uh, the religious right tries to do is have, you know, a number of Supreme Court justices, which, you know, I believe they are very happy right now with the way things stand and so on and so forth. But in reality, that's not really gonna reduce the amount of abortion. So to the second question, what, what would be some ways 
if, if, if we really are serious, which I think everyone should be about reducing abortion, what are some actual ways that we can go about uh, reducing abortion? Yeah, it's, you know, look, reproductive health policy is not my area of expertise, but I have some opinions. So they're just mine. Um, and I'm happy to share them with you. Look, the number one reason people have abortions is because they're made pregnant against their will. They don't want to be pregnant. And so the primary means of reducing abortion is to reduce unintended pregnancies. And it seems to me that that approach has to be multidimensional. I mean, the first and most obvious solution here is access to a birth control that is affordable effective, easy to use, and safe. And we've seen in recent years that new technologies in birth control have reduced the rates of abortion dramatically in, among those who use them, um, very effective means of uh, birth control. Um, so I think, frankly, we ought to encourage more investment in discovering new and improved and safer means of birth, you know, birth control technologies and frankly, I don't think we should just be focused on women in this area. It takes two to get pregnant, right? To, to make a pregnancy. But you know, birth control access is just one solution, um, one part of the solution. I think education, um, educating both men and women about the facts of reproduction is really important. And I think we need to promote a culture, a, a real culture of consent so that people who are entering intimate relationships do so voluntarily. And both parties, not just women, but men too, are really invested in preventing pregnancy if they don't want that to happen. Yeah, what about the economy? Do you think that uh, plays a factor as far as uh, poverty and not yes. that, you know? Go yes, ahead. absolutely. And I can't believe I left that out. I mean, a big part of the solution is economic. Um, something like 59% of women seeking abortions are already mothers. And mothers know how resource intensive it is, it is to raise children. Uh, some of those women are making this decision um, because they don't feel like they can afford to grow their families. Um, part of that has to do, frankly, with the fact that for decades, the uh, right, the religious right has been allied with that economic far right libertarian um, policies that have promoted the existing economic inequalities, the sort of record levels of economic inequality that we're facing today. And they're, they're promoting policies that are making it harder for families to succeed and harder for families to, to add members if, 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 they're, if they feel like they can't. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, the, the other thing is in chapter nine of your book, you basically cover privatizing schools, which uh, I live in Michigan. So Michigan, I think is, I think you've listed the second most privatized uh, we have some of the most privatized schools in the nation uh, here. Um, so I, I guess my question is, can you please kind of share about what you have uncovered in your research as to what you believe is a real motive behind privatizing, uh, you know, schools as far as voucher programs and charter schools and so forth? Absolutely. And, you know, let me preface this by saying I'm not against all charters or vouchers are all vouchers and I think, you know, private and religious schools and responsible homeschooling all, should all be options available to families that want them. I mean, I su support, um, you know, some diversity in, you know, education. I think we need to have a, you know, choice has a meaningful role to play, but we can't overlook the fact that many of the religiously motivated school choice activists are not interested in improving education overall but really in, they're in, they've had a sort of longstanding aim of destroying public education altogether. Um, public schools educate 90% of American school children and we should seek to protect them, you know, these schools and improve them even at the same time as we're supporting um, diverse um, and carefully implemented education strategies. So, Let's take a deeper look at the hostility to public education. Um, the hostility uh, to public schools runs very deep in the sort of Christian nationalist movement. Um, it, 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 it runs much deeper than even the sort of um, uh, hostility to segregating uh, to desegregated public schools from Brown versus Board of Ed. I mean, it runs, you know, really far back, but you know, it, it, in 1979, Jerry Falwell made sort of imbibed that hostility and he sort of made the agenda clear. He said, I hope to see the days when there are no, no more public schools 
churches will have, have taken them over and Christians will be running them. And uh, there's a fellow named D. James Kennedy, who I pulled this, uh, he, Betsy DeVos's family invested at least $5.5 million in this guy's ministry. His name is D. James Kennedy. He had a ministry called Coral Ridge Ministry. He was one of the sort of um, ministers who spoke a lot on the radio. He had all these radio programs. He was very powerful in his day. Um, and he wrote, this is, a, this is a pamphlet that was made out of a sermon that he wrote. It's called A Godly Education. And he, he's writing all these terrible things about public schools. So here's what he wrote. My friends, the anti-Christian, anti-God bias, he's talking about public schools, the censorship of all things Christian and the infusion of an atheistic, amoral, evolutionary, socialistic, one world, anti-American system of education in our public schools has indeed become such that if it had been done by an enemy, it we would be considered an act of war. This is what they think of public schools. So. I mean, the, the hostility of public schools has at its root, it's so contemptuous, but it, it has at its root a kind of um, uh, hostility to pluralism. And, you know, um, the critique of the government schools has to do with pluralism. It has to do with integration. It has to do um, with, um, you know, public schools are non-sectarian, which means they neither promote nor denigrate any particular religious viewpoint, but they see this, anything that doesn't affirm their view as somehow hostile to it. They don't understand that, um, they don't understand the tolerance for pluralism. And the, you know, one of the best things about public schools is they teach children how to get along with their peers, even children of diverse religious and political backgrounds. But, you know, religious right leaders see that as somehow hostile to them. Um, you know, Matt Staber, he's a president and co-founder of Liberty Council, which is one of the religious rights or legal advocacy groups. He described public schools as spiritual battlegrounds. You know, um, he said, when you remove Christ as the foundation for education, that which was intended for good becomes a consequence of evil. So they think anything that is not absolutely grounded and constantly affirming their view is somehow um, worthless. I mean, it's a, it's a very nihilistic view. It, it, it's basically the view that all of the successes of a modern pluralistic um, society are, are somehow worthless. And, uh, and then anything that somehow isn't constantly, you know, you know, flattering them and, and, and affirming them is somehow, um, you know, just, a, you know, it's, it's absolutely worthless. It's fascinating. It is. I mean, I, I, I'm not sure if this was in your book or in another. I've been kind of going through a whole lot of books recently, but it's almost like there really isn't a desire for democracy, really. It's more theocracy that is what is being grasped for. That's absolutely true. I mean, you know, that uh, G. James Kennedy, whose pamphlet I read from earlier, he told followers in 2005 that they need to exercise godly dominion over every aspect and institution of human society, including the government. Now, not every anti-public school activist, of course, is a Seven Mountains Dominionist, but um, you can see the many of the activists have been very hostile to um, a, a, a separation of church and state, for sure, and also the idea of a, of a society that isn't constantly affirming them. So the voucher activist, May Dugan, she was a conservative Catholic uh, and she was co-founder with her husband of a group called Citizens for Educational Freedom, which at one point represented 300 voucher organizations. So she was a very uh, well-connected longtime voucher activist and she had um, connections to Betsy DeVos who sort of honored her with a bigger award at one point uh, through one of her organizations. So uh, May Duggan once said, we don't want people teaching humanism. Humanism is the basis of the public schools. So, um, you know, that's what it is. They don't believe in non-religious education. They certainly don't believe in uh, any education that isn't grounded in their understanding of the faith. So, you know, at the end of the day, should we support school choice in some forms? Absolutely. Should we, we, should we be using the idea of choice as a cover for the destruction of our public education system? Uh, absolutely not. Yeah, that's, that was scary. 
again, especially being in Michigan, it's like, really? Well, it, when you see what's happened with the massive deregulation efforts in places like Detroit, where, you know, Betsy DeVos and her allies in the sort of mo like privatization movement have argued that, oh, choice is going to resolve all these problems. And you saw massive deregulation in, in Detroit and, uh, and I mean, it's happened in certain cities around the country. New Orleans is another city. And what you have is like the, you know, the, the public at schools collapsed because all of these uh, voucher activists, you know, got in. A lot of them were frankly motivated by money. Some were relig uh, religiously motivated, and some of the, uh, the charters they started were were not regulated. And many of them collapsed. And it, also, the public education system collapsed. Um, you know, uh, and and public schools, of course, are uh, you know neighborhood schools are. Uh, really important for the life of neighborhoods and the life of communities. So you see in these areas where you have massive unregulated charters, uh, unaccountable, you, uh, they're not just detrimental to public school, public education, but they're also often detrimental to the children and families who are enrolled in them. Wow, wow. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so, um, as I was kind of going through your book, and uh, I think for me, it was kind of like, so I do puzzles with my grandma. So I oh. need to get back out there. It's, I haven't been out there for a little bit just because of COVID and crazy schedules, but it was kind of like putting puzzles together and like understanding like everything, you know? Well, not everything, but a lot of things. And uh, one of the things was, um, which comes to the second last question here is in reference to political activism on the religious right, which seems very high. And uh, you mentioned a number of things, but two of them are Pro Project Blitz um, and then United in Purpose. So can you share about some of those aspects? Because I think as even as you said earlier, it seems like, you know, this is really not a, you know, let's honor God and sacrifice and really be pleasing to society and that aroma that's pleasing to God but it's more like be divulged into a political uh, weapon, if you will. So yeah. can you share a little bit about Project Bliss and United Way? I'm sorry, United in, in Purpose. Absolutely. Um, as far as their political posturing and just how they work. Yeah, the movement, you know, to get at what you said, is like the movement is a machine and it's really not so much leadership driven as organization driven. So it, it um, consists of a variety of for-profit and non-profit organizations, including legislative initiatives like Project Blitz, which I'll describe in a minute, data initiatives like United and Purpose and I360, which I'll also tell you about, um, legal advocacy groups like the Alliance Defending Freedom and Liberty Council, which I mentioned earlier, and a few others, um, uh, or, um, networking organizations like the Council for National Policy and, and groups like that. Um, and what unites them is not so much a sort of any um, specific theologies, but more like a common political vision. I, I wrote the power worshipers um, because I almost like wanted to take the back off the watch. So you can kind of see how the machinery moves. You, you did know, that, also, you did that. Well, thank you. And I also focused on some of the really, I, I thought intriguing personalities of the movement. Oh, but I wanna stop real quick. So the other thing you mentioned was Malawi. So we'll get to that in a second. Because oh, I think yeah. you mentioned there was a gentleman, the capital capital ministries, I think, right. the family and others are kind of like branching all over the world. So we, we'll get to that, but go okay, ahead. Okay, good. I would love that. So let me tell you a little bit about uh, Project Blitz. So the idea behind these legislative initiatives like Project Blitz um, is to overwhelm state legislatures with identical or very similar bills based on centrally manufactured legislation. Like, do you know what um, the American Legislative Exchange Council, uh, ALEC, American Legislative Exchange Council, it's, um, it's uh, they craft model legislation. They get put together lawmakers, you know, lawyers and lawmakers and people like lobbyists and things like that. They'll, they'll craft a piece of legislation. And then all these politicians who are sort of favorable to this agenda will sort of adopt the same language in their bills or maybe very similar language in their bills and they send introduce it into their states so that all of a sudden you have, I mean, it could relate to car insurance policy. Well, all of a sudden you have identical bills in like 30 states related to car insurance policy. Well, huh. Project Blitz is the ideas are kind of do the same thing um, 
for what they call like religious freedom legislation, but what they really want to do is conflate their, you know, associate their idea of religion with government more closely and, and degrade the separation of church and state in all these small ways. So um, Project Bliss is the same thing. The idea is to sort of craft a piece of model legislation, then all of these um, lawmakers who are sort of um, in line with this agenda take, take it and then introduce bills, very identical or um, very similar or identical bills into their states. And it's, they're all based on the centrally manufactured legislation. So when I was researching Project Blitz, um, I listened in on a couple of conference calls that had been made public on their website of, uh, I think it was the Congressional Prayer Caucus, perhaps there was like one of the organizations affiliated with Project Blitz had put a couple of conference calls on their website and you could listen to them. I think they pulled them down uh, by now. But so I heard a member of the steering team um, the steering committee tell the state legislatures from around the country, he said, it's kind of like whack-a-mole for the other side. It'll drive them crazy. They'll have to divide the resources in opposing this, but it'll move the ball down the road. So, so a lot of the bills that appear in the state legislatures, like you're going to put in God we trust in every public school, you're going to put a, an in God we trust sign in every police car and things like that. These, they might sort of appear to be local initiatives driven by local personalities, but they're not. They're really part of a nationally coordinated strategy. So the question is, what do they want? Well, one aim is to secure privileges for members of certain favored groups in society and to single out other non-favored groups like LGBT Americans, um, but also people who um, are members of religious minority groups or who, people who don't happen to be religious at all. They single them out for contempt. Um, and you know, even um, people who are, I dare to identify as Christians of a different sort. You know, um, so a, a short-term goal of these types of initiatives sort of like classic culture war stuff, they're trying to provoke the other side to complain and oppose the bill so that they can rile up their own base and provoke their feelings of persecution that's so important to their movement. But the longer term goals really include conflating in the idea of the public, like the, in, in the minds of the public, their religion with the authority of government and, and you know, entrenching certain assumptions about the role of their religion in our national identity. Mm, mm, mm. And then the other one was United in Purpose. Is that is there anything you wanted to share on that? Oh yeah, um, United in Purpose was a sophisticated data initiative whose founder boasted that they had access to virtually all of the voting age public in America. He said, we have 2, 000, uh, 200 million voter files in our database. We know it makes Americans turned out to vote one way or not vote at all. And they used targeted messaging to reach voters and they operated through churches in many instances. They gave pastors very sophisticated tools to figure out like what percentage of their congregants had voted in the last election. Then they would give them all of these tools, messaging tools to kind of get them to vote their biblical values, usually on issues like abortion, same-sex marriage and stuff like that. So that organization has actually struggled in the last year or so with what appear to be some financial mismanagement issues, but there are other data organizations that are serving the same purpose. So United and Purpose was just one of several entities on the right with access to this comprehensive voter data. Uh, the billionaire brothers, Charles and David Koch, um, who are mega funders of the economic right also invested in um, data operations and what they call persuasion models you know, Cambridge Analytica, they sort of um, devise these persuasion models. They sort of take all this great data from people's Facebook pages and the like and figure out what makes them tick. Well, I360 has done uh, similar kinds of things um, uh, through uh, just in terms of creating, um, you know, micro-targeting uh, messaging to get people to vote uh, a certain way. And they've done that through this uh, organization called I360. Um, so um, according to um, it, uh, the Center on Media and Democracy, um, uh, it, by I think it's 2018, they had developed personality profiles on, I don't know, close to 100 million uh, American voters. And they were basically micro-targeting messengers in, in, in ways that would sort of, um, you know, create more effective political communications. So no, of course, 
all political parties of all persuasions use data in order to increase the effectiveness of their um, efforts in, in, in campaign seasons. But the difference with organizations like United and Purpose is that they are operating, and a lot of these other sort of data initiatives, they're operating at the top of a, a large pyramid that is operating in the religious sphere, um, all of which is uh, exempt from taxes, right? And, and from scrutiny from, you know, by the IRS, because religions don't have to open up their, their books the same way that they do. Yeah, I think you mentioned uh, on another portion, and this is maybe towards the beginning of the book or so, uh, or somewhere in there, cultural impact teams and they who are sponsored by the uh, uh, FRC, uh, Family oh. Resource Center. Right, right. Yeah. And they they had like a 180 page binder, which had all the specific ways about how to go about things. And, you know, there's just so much in there that um, allowed them to be political without being political. Like they kind of made it so they were kind of under the radar, even though they, we all know what they were doing. That's right. Like I, I was talking to a pastor about this type of initiative. He said it threads a separate a, a church, a church, of, wait, he said, it's a God-given loophole. And he said it threads a separation of church and state loophole. I thought that was interesting. The idea with those teams is like, you know, the pastor's not supposed to tell the congregants how to vote, but they can give them these really detailed messaging materials that tell them how to vote their biblical values. And it ends up boiling down to like two or three issues like abortion. Well, you know, when, you know, the movement leaders are talking to the pastors about issues that should matter to their congregants, it's all abortion all the time. <laughs> abortion is the beginning, the end, but then a lot of it has to do with also, you know, what they call pro-family stuff, which is, you know, anti-same-sex marriage and the like. So they know if you can get people to vote on those couple of issues, you can control their vote. Yeah, and I think the last thing I'll say on that, and we'll, we'll wrap it up, was uh, I think with Drollinger, you mentioned that um, they, favor things like a strong military, they favor uh, obviously the strong man, which in a lot of ways I believe led to things like, you know, voting for someone like Trump, Donald, Donald Trump as president. And, and that's, you know, that is where it is. But I think the other thing I learned was that this isn't just in the United States, but this is like, I just want to say metastasizing into other countries uh, including like Malawi, um, I don't know if you said, I think you said Tanzania, uh, you know, other, other places like that. And I, I, is it kind of the same thing where they're just saying, you know, religious, you know, religious values and trying to encourage government, government officials to use scripture to make policy? Is that the intent? Yeah, you know, Ralph Drollinger has established outposts for his capital ministries in dozens of countries around the world, including Malawi, Tanzania, Ghana, Latvia, uh, so many others. And, um, you know, he's been very active in Eastern Europe. He's got a number of different um, directors, sort of sub-directors for his organization that have to do with different sort of, I think he calls them affinity spheres or different parts of the world. So um, this ideology that he's teaching um, is not just limited to political leaders in the United States. Mm -hmm. Well, this is this last question as we wrap it up is kind of a no brainer, um, but I just wanted to kind of get your take on it, which is, you know, basically from your research, is the church stronger or weaker when it's involved in partisan politics and it's really trying to be like those power worshipers, as you noted in your, in your book? So obviously the answer is no, but can you just break that down a little bit? Well, it's an interesting question. I mean, I think it could raise a lot of kind of metaphysical and theological issues. I mean, after all, many religions do seek to share their message and thereby exert a kind of sense of power in the world. Um, but I think the distinction matters more in a prosaic sense. I mean, religious nationalism is a force in our world, not because it has better ideas, but because it has more money and it's better organized and it has a lot of um, sort of organizational discipline. And you can see that, you know, if you investigate the movement as I have, you can see that it ends up, the, you can see the way it ends up treating its own supposed religious principles, right? I think it goes without saying that over the past four years, there isn't a single religious principle of this movement 
that uh, they haven't kind of essentially mm, sold off in exchange for political power. I mean, even a corrupt sociopath was better in their eyes than the sort of freedom that are, you know, uh, sort of pl uh, pluralistic, um, uh, that the religious moderates and, and progressives and, and, even, and the non-religious have to offer in a pluralistic society. So um, I think it's also really important to note that, um, you know, the church is so diverse you know, there are so many different um, ways to be a uh, Christian, so many different interpretations of uh, theology. I think most American Christians for sure reject the politics of conquest and division that this represents. And I think um, um, most, um, you know, are really kind of horrified by the sort of hijack and exploitation of faith for political purposes. Frankly, I think we all should be. I think, you know, we have to, mm, you know, there are a number of religious leaders just off the top of my head, I'm thinking about people like Reverend William Barber, but there's so many others who are very explicit and informed in their rejection of religious nationalism. Yeah, I, it just was scary. And I, I'm naturally, as you can probably tell, a very curious person. So I, I always wondered like, how is this happening? And I can understand looking at some passages differently, but this is a whole total, this is like the rich man's Bible, you know? And, and I'm like, that's not what Jesus was about. You know, he was definitely here for the, the downtrodden, the least of these and these kinds of things. So your book really helped, as you said, uh, take Thank the you. back of the watch off to really help see how all the gears work and how everything comes together. So I know this is like a decade of research that you put in. Uh, I definitely appreciate it. And, and I know that uh, the audience that's watching it definitely will too. So again, thanks so much for your time. Those who uh, enjoy the episode, uh, please click like and definitely consider subscribing. Thanks so much for your time. Thank you so much.